Uh, we're going to have a keynote by my friend Elizabeth Littlefield, um, who is the president and CEO of OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. And then we're going to have a response from Mr. Malcolm Brown, who is the one of uh, three uh, deputy ministers for, with, with a, with whose portfolio is development in the Department of uh, Foreign Affairs, Trade, and Development of the Canadian government. Um, CSIS has been working for three years, or four years now, on the role of DFIs in development. We put out a report three years ago, a bipartisan report on strengthening um, U.S. development finance capabilities. Um, OPEC is the development finance institution for the United States. And, but there are a number of additional instruments that some other government agencies have that support private investment in a variety of ways. I know that Canada and Australia are in the process of thinking about how to create uh, development finance institutions, or at least there's a little bit of a sense, I think, of that both governments are, are thinking about this. And so I think we'll hear a little bit more about that. And I know that the minister mentioned that this morning. So I think it would be uh, really quite welcome to hear from Elizabeth Littlefield. She's been a friend to CSIS, and I think she's one of the more, really one of the most gifted public servants of the Obama administration, and I think has been a great leader for OPEC and is very well regarded here in Washington. Uh, she had a past life uh, working at, at the equivalent of the Major League Baseball Commission for Microfinance, at the, uh, in, at the, in, in, um, as well as we're in working as well as was a, uh, was a uh, business leader at J.P. Morgan before that. So has been in the microfinance world, uh, part of the, uh, as well as been in, um, in actual, in real finance. So uh, Elizabeth, without further ado, please come on up. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Dan, for that very uh, kind introduction and also for your leadership on this topic. CSIS has really emerged as you know, a leading voice on the role of the private sector uh, and public-private partnerships uh, to, to advance development objectives. So, um, I'm just gonna push this mic away. Um, so I am a super passionate believer in the role of business as a force for good, and I think the world is waking up to that. Um, so I wanted to say a few words about why that is, why I'm such a believer, what the trajectory of the DFI model has, has been, um, and then come to a few recommendations that I would have and then I have actually been giving, given to countries that are thinking of creating their own, some mistakes not to make that have been made by others such as ourselves. Um, so first of all, when you sort of step back and look at what are the huge forces shaping the future of our world in the next decade or so, I see three big forces that are coming together in very, very powerful ways. One, resource scarcity, whether it be water or forestry or clean air or species, Resource scarcity is going to be driving the conflicts, the wars, and a lot of the issues that we worry about in the next decade or so. Two is the growing middle class and the fact that they're consuming those resources at exponentially faster rates than they ever did in previous generations. And then the third coming in there is, is of course, climate change. So these three forces, as you, as you see, as they work together to exacerbate each other or to reduce each other, um, clearly... Those, they're not going to be solved, addressed, or slowed without the private sector. And the private sector is not going to engage without the public sector. So there at the heart, you have, for me, the explanation as to why organizations like development finance institutions are critical because they are the bridge between private sector investment and development challenges. Because our mandate, all of us, all of the DFIs, is really to catalyze private investment flows in the service of development. Uh, in, in the countries in which we operate. So the good news is that this has been happening. Um, if you look at when OPIC, my organization, was carved out of USAID 40-odd years ago, at that time, the, the financial resources flowing towards emerging markets from the U.S. was about 95% ODA and only about 5% FDI. Do I need to explain those two? Overseas Development Assistance and Foreign Direct Investment. And now, of course, in the ensuing 40 years, that's completely flipped the other way around. And the vast majority of our engagement in emerging markets is foreign direct investment. In fact, it's FDI is seven times ODA and growing incredibly rapidly. In fact, um, just last year, the development finance institution model of doing development, the private sector-led model, 
grew 10 times faster than the ODA model. So it's, it's, it's happening. Uh, emerging markets countries are now attracting a trillion dollars a year in FDI, every single year. So it's exciting and it's, and it's happening and it's powerful. And the DFI model, of course, is growing in step with this increasing engagement of the private sector uh, in development. The, in the excellent report that you, Dan, authored, that CSS put together, was it last year or the year before? Um, you drew a circle around 18 of the development finance institutions. And of course, we're privileged to have Peter Voicke, former head of one of them, the IFC, the biggest. But of the 18 development finance institutions that you cited, they went from $10 billion in financing to $40 billion over the last decade. So the, gro the growth is tremendous. You look at CDC, who's grown at 260% since 2009. You know, FMO is growing at 67%, and now FMO, the, the, the Dutch DFI, is bigger uh, in terms of portfolio than, than Dutch ODA, which is a big number to start with. Um, the Chinese added 550 staff to the China Development Bank just last year. And of course, we've all heard the announcement of the BRICS getting together and creating their own DFI to be capitalized with squillions of dollars. I don't even know what the number is, but it was big. Um, so this model is working. Um, then you see other interesting things, such as the growth of the IFC, which has now grown so big and profitable that it's cross-subsidizing the World Bank. So one, think, one can start thinking about ecosystems wherein private sector capital flows and the financing of them can actually start cross-subsidizing uh, foreign aid. And, and so that's something we can explore maybe, maybe later on in the discussion. Maybe just a quick word on how is OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, stacking up against this growth happening elsewhere? Well, we too are growing uh, very quickly, at least in terms of financial resources, but sadly not in terms of human resources. Uh, we run about an $18 billion portfolio now, which is about 80% loans and finance and about 20% um, political risk insurance. Uh, last year, we generated $426 million right back to the Treasury to cross-subsidize, actually, some of the other development um, uh, activities of, of the U.S. government. We're working in about 106 countries and have put a real premium on low-income countries, which are now about a third of our total. We've also put a real emphasis in the last few years uh, on renewable resources. Um, and are very proud to have seen our portfolio in the renewable resource area, hearkening back to what I said in the beginning, because we see resource scarcity as being uh, so crucial. Um, we've seen our portfolio there grow from uh, actually a hundredfold from the du double digits uh, in 2008 to 100 million in 2009, 300 million, and now we do about a billion dollars a year in renewable resources of the four billion that we do on, on, on average. So just an idea of the kind of projects that we're talking about that do bring together um, uh, the private sector and, 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 and development objectives. And maybe I'll just mention the francophone ones because I know that's of particular interest to this, this group. You know, for example, in, in Haiti, we're working with a, a, a couple of Dominican brothers who are using rubble from the uh, earthquake and turning it into building materials for low-income housing, green low-income housing. Uh, in Rwanda, we've built the first ever uh, solar uh, off-grid solar plant that's going to be that eventually will be grid connected. Um, we're in South Sudan, believe it or not, we're building a, a three-star hotel because that country is going to need to have some place for people to stay if they're ever going to invest, which of course won't happen until the conflict's over. Um, and then we're doing some big utility scale work like solar, solar in uh, South Africa, like the biggest wind farm in Africa in Lake Turkana, um, as well as some of the biggest wind farms uh, in Senegal and, and, and elsewhere. So those are the kind of projects. Now, so that's where we're coming from. What I wanted to say to this group in particular is, over the last 40 years of experience in the development finance institution model, we've, well, a lot of things have changed and we've learned a lot. And I think it's a seriously exciting opportunity for Canada to have a, a late mover advantage and skip all of the steps. You guys were talking about cell phones and breakthroughs and leapfrogging earlier. But this is a great opportunity to really take stock of uh, the lessons learned from other organizations because it's so much harder to fix something when it doesn't work than it is to get it right from the start. So, um, you know, markets have changed, the bricks have arrived, there's new scrutiny on all of us. Uh, companies are waking up to the opportunities in emerging markets, so a lot of things have changed. So I wanted to just give four thoughts on the four things that if I were starting from a clean slate with the experience now of four years leading um, OPIC, 
what I would do. Now, recognizing that every country has its own political reality, and the political reality in this country can be more difficult than, than some, um, there's still four things I would absolutely consider. And let me mention what they are, if I may, as we then fold into the conversation that we'll have uh, right now. So first, I would definitely make sure it is run like a business. An independent board, insist that it be self-sustaining, allow it to keep some of its own profits to pay for its operations on the, in the ensuing years, allow it to pay its staff competitively with the private markets. You can't run an investment bank that's mandated to work in the most difficult markets in the world, only do deals that no one else would do, has to make money every year, and do that with civil servant salaries. Um, make sure it's, it's managing both the asset and the liability side of the balance sheet, rather than just the asset side. You need flexibility on, on both sides to both sell notes to whoever you want to, as well as to extend credit. And then, of course, make sure it's developed, it's, it's measuring its, its, uh, its development impact. So for me, all that runs into a bucket you know, of accountability, self, self, being self-sustaining, uh, and being run like a business. The second thing, which is controversial, uh, but I feel very strongly about it, is do not overload it with unrelated mandates. No more tied aid. Do not confuse the export promotion agenda with the development agenda. They're two completely opposite missions and mandates with very different incentives built in. Um, don't carry out politically motivated lending. Don't let the politicians tell you where to lend. Um, with all due respect to the politicians in the room, oops. Um, but I think the most important thing is, is this separation of the export promotion agenda from the development agenda. It, you can't optimize the two objectives at, at once. Uh, in many cases, actually we're the only uh, development finance institution that is required to work with countries, with companies of our country of origin. We need to have a U.S. investor involved in every deal we do, but at the same time, we're being asked to work in difficult markets, and I see some of our colleagues here who work with us in those markets, like Afghanistan and South Sudan and Iraq, but you've got to find an American investor to a company that's, that's by definition, trying to do development with two high hands tied behind your back. Most of the other DFIs encourage the engagement of their companies of their country of origin, but don't require it. Third, I would definitely give it the tools that it needs to do the job. And here, Dan and, and many others around town uh, in the think tank community and academia have been hugely supportive of OPIC, recognizing that we actually lack the, the tools we need to do the job we, we need to do. But, but those, those tools, of course, include equity, authority, it includes long-term debt, it can include insurance. In some cases, people have recommended it, 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 it include the ability to do technical assistance. And then fourth, um, I would say it is crucially important that, um, that the development architecture of a country clearly distinguish between the non-commercial aid-related business that doesn't have to make money because it's doing things that, that, that investment can't do, and the commercially run, run it like a business, banking business, which is private sector driven. It's very important to have clear lanes uh, and to stay in those lanes. Um, Dan has re recommended in a couple of cases, as have many others around town, that OPIC be given the ability to make grants. I've actually come back and said, I'd rather not have the ability to do grants. I'd like to have a clear, bright line around our commercial activities, but have preferred access to those, uh, those grant fit re resources that are available elsewhere uh, in the U.S. government. So those would be the, the, the things I would, I would mention in terms of the four pieces of advice. Run it like a business. Don't over overload it with unrelated mandates. Give it the tools it needs and establish clear lines between the commercial and the aid business. Um, and with that, I would just close by saying it's been an incredible privilege and one of the you know, greatest excitements of my career to be have spent the last four years working with a terrific team of people who work under tremendous constraints but are doing a fabulous job at doing deals no one else will do in incredibly difficult markets and making money uh, at the same time for the taxpayer. So it's been a, it's been a great privilege, and I, and I thank you for inviting me here to talk about it. Thanks, Thanks. Elizabeth. Thank you very much. <laughs> have a seat. Yes, yeah, yeah. Malcolm Brown, please come on up to the, to the podium, and, and um, I hope you can provide a response, or you, could do it, you can do it from there either way, however you'd um, like to do it. Okay. On, I guess. Uh, I'll do it from here. Um, so, <clears throat> where to begin? Um, I have these carefully prepared remarks that you know, start with me being, you know, um, ad-libbing and all that kind of stuff. Um, 
And um, there's some people in the room, I think, have helped contribute to them, and I'm going to kind of ignore them. Um, and we'll let the record show that I read them and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, it, because um, I think it would be a more uh, interesting conversation. Um, a couple of things. One, um, and this is actually what's reflected in these remarks, is the role of the private sector. I think that's the, from a development perspective, that's the big sea change. Um, and uh, that's why I think we're interested generally in events like this and uh, it, you know, you, I'm new to this business, um, started in May, but one of the things that struck me early on is the general consensus that if you look at, you know, Africa as a case in point, well, it's not a straight line or anything like that, and, and you look at the last 10 or 20 years compared to the previous 60, um, that the, uh, it's a different way of saying what Elizabeth said, um, but you control for, um, uh, you look at sources of economic growth and the role of official development assistance pales in comparison to the role of private sector investment. We have issues around distribution of, of rents or income and all that kind of thing, but it, everyone in the business I'm struck by, and I've spent a lot of time in the last four or five months talking to people because I'm in the sponge mode, uh, and across the full spectrum, there's a real acknowledgement about uh, the actual, the absolute essential role that the private sector needs to play. So that's one thing, and, and uh, it also is a priority of the government and all that kind of thing. So, you know, Robert, anybody asks, I read the speaking lines. Um, but more interestingly, I think the conversation around DFI is, an, is a, and Canada's approach to that is a, um, is, is an example of, uh, of uh, the kinds of conversations that are taking place. Uh, we can, I mean, a, a nice way of putting it is the advantage of being a late mover. Um, in other circles, it's we're late to the party. Uh, and some have said, uh, why bother? Everybody else has got one. Does Canada need one? You can partner. There's no exclusion. Uh, most uh, DFIs uh, uh, will partner with almost anybody. Um, there are each of the, some of them have varying constraints, as, as Elizabeth described, but it's a... Um, it's pretty. Uh, it's a pretty open field. So there, there, there has been a conversation uh, led by some about in Canada. Why bother? That's a minority view, I'd say. Um, this is a very timely conversation, and I have to be careful because of our cabinet process. There are deliberations that are going on that I have to be careful. I don't go too far, uh, or. Um, uh, successors to Mr. Brody here will, will have a conversation with me. So I have to uh, um, tread carefully around some conversations, but I can, I think, talk about some of the issues that, um, uh, that are at play, uh, and still we can still have, a, I think, a good exchange. Um, I think one of the, uh, starting off, uh, Elizabeth's four areas, um, it's almost like you've been in our conversations. Um, in terms of the kinds of issues. There are a few others that we've been focused on, but I think in terms of the questions around uh, run it like a business uh, and um, uh, the, uh, assuring that it's actually got a, a, a market focus, recognizing, um, you described it as swim lanes, uh, Elizabeth, uh, the, the space that a DFI occupies. We've done a lot of round tables with the private sector in Canada, and it's, it, it's interesting um, that for many people, it occupies a very big space, everything from trade promotion, as in, you know, com or trade uh, commercial officers would be part of this, through to high-level finance that is, um, uh, you know, the traditional space of, of pension funds. Um, and so, it's really important to be really clear about, I think, uh, uh, mandate, and, and, and that's got to be a very clear conversation. I think you can land in different places on it. I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all, and that uh, the government will, will, will come to its conclusions on. But I think there, there's no dispute. Whatever you pick, you need to be very clear about where you're trying to fit. Uh, I, I do think um, DFIs, there's a, it's a... 
and one across the spectrum, it's quite a narrow spot, but it's very deep in terms of the potential. I mean, everyone knows the infrastructure potential in Africa, for example, trillion plus dollars, uh, uh, hydro, you know, you can go down the list. So it's a huge potential there. But blurring of mandates in terms of where concessional grants, which is what I'm responsible for, and the gray zone of uh, potentially concessional financing, which is different, lower than you know the rates of return that uh, uh, pension funds would be looking for. Um, there's a zone there. It's it's and it's 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 um, I think uh, will be the subject of lots of conversation. Um, partnerships uh, will be very clear. I think I think the you know this is about. Um, um, finding ways. There's a view about the uh, about uh, a gap in the uh, sort of capital stream um, in terms of um, uh, risk and who can tolerate risk. And there's a particular gap that DFIs can fill. And our one of our views is what's the most effective way to fill that gap for developing countries, but also for uh, the private sector in Canada to take advantage of that. I think that'd be perfect. Uh, need to be perfectly clear on that point. I think one of the big, there are two issues that I think we're also uh, that I've been interested in talking about uh, and exploring. One is Elizabeth said early on um, by citing the growth of FDI and DFIs generally and that kind of thing. The model's working. I actually think the jury's out on that, and I, I think we have evidence that the market is moving in that direction, but we've seen market failures before. Uh, and I think we, we need to demonstrate um, the role that DFIs can play in actually advancing both a private sector agenda, but also a development agenda. Uh, and they're not, there'll be some who view these as mutually exclusive. I actually don't think they are, but I think we have to do a better job of, uh, you know, when I, as I was doing my parish visits this summer, I was, at the World Bank talking to people, IFC and that kind of thing, and I sort of said, so tell me about the results. And so there are individual projects, but in terms of actually drawing that, I'm a social scientist, I guess, by training, and, and the kind of, the level of the ability to attribute is really important in terms of, of coming to conclusions. Too often social scientists forget that bit. Uh, I think that's true in the private in the private sector in the capital markets in terms of saying DFIs are this great solution. I, there's no question things are going on, but I think we have to do a better job of of articulating that. So that is one place where I I might quibble a bit. The other question, and it's one in, around which I've heard differing views and do not um, it, it, people's position depends on where they're sitting. It's the question of crowding out. Um, and uh, there are those in the um, uh, development uh, finance world who view, frankly, the role of the World Bank and other organizations as essentially skimming the cream and not leaving much left over for anyone else and approaching their zone uh, where they're prepared to tolerate higher risk but, but uh, rates of return are, are, are such that uh, they're being pushed out. Um, Clearly, IFC, uh, anybody else in the zone, I think, recognizes it's an issue, but there, I think there's a real view that there's a, there's a dispute on this point, and uh, I think just in our own conversations in Canada, we're going to have to have a point of view about this question and how to address crowding out, because uh, you are using public money to play in a zone that's more traditionally, because Canada's not been involved, more traditionally been the, uh, however, well or badly, the purview of the private sector. And that's a really important conversation. Uh, and uh, you've got to bring evidence to that, uh, that uh, discussion. Um, the final thing, um, and I think this is actually going to be a tough one. Um, I was going to make a crack about your point about uh, remuneration. Um, I think that's actually going to be in Canada a challenge. Um, and uh, we'll have to figure that out. We've, we've managed it with our export development bank and that kind of thing, so I think we can manage that. People are going to do this not because they're going to want to make a ton of money, uh, the, many of whom will have already been successful in the private sector and are coming over to this conversation you know, uh, as a second career. Um, 
And so I think we can manage that without getting uh, drawn into a really ugly conversation around, um, around uh, salary levels. We see, we see it too often and I think it ends up being a distraction. So by way of um, just starting our conversation, I'll stop there and we can go from there. Elizabeth, why don't I give you a chance to respond because I think those are some very interesting yeah. points that Malcolm's put on the table. And he certainly, he's going there to use the idiomatic expression in terms of some of the some of the hotter topics on this on, in this in the world of VFIs. I'm going to also use my uh, pri uh, the privilege as the chair. To, I'm going to just put on notice if uh, Harold Rosen is here, who was at IC for a long time, and I'm going to want to hear from him as well in terms of his views about this conversation. And I think. Uh, I'm not sure if Peter's still here, but he or he will be. He just left. He'll be. He's coming back in a little bit. But I'm going to. I wanted to make sure that put, put Harold on notice that I'm going to be calling on him. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, Elizabeth. Go ahead. Thank you for those those comments. And certainly that's how we, and on the pay issue, that's how we've handled it. Two people work there because they believe in what they're doing, and uh, and they're not financially constrained. But it's it's definitely a, it's a challenge. Yeah. And most people are there as a second career. Too. But I want to just touch on two big areas that you focused on. One is the whole notion of what is it concessional or not? Um, and the other is the whole question about are we being catalytic or are we crowding out? And th I guess that's best wrapped in the word additionality. Um, so on the concessionality, I think... You just want to just explain what is additionality for those... For those uh, okay, I'll do that when I, when I come to that. Yeah. So on the question is, is it concessional or not? Um, I think the key thing is to figure out what what are the unique and complementary risks and appetites and capabilities that we have versus the other financing parties? Mm -hmm. So for example, we find sometimes that even though we lack an equity authority, we can do really long tenors and we can do very large size. Mm -hmm. So in our partnerships with other entities, they bring the equity, we do the long tenors and the thing, the thing works. But I think condition, uh, con this notion of concessional versus non-concessional, can manifest itself in not just price. So it's tenor, where we'll do 25 years, but nobody else will do 25 years, where we'll take risks that by definition nobody else will take, um, some of which we've come to regret. <laughs> um, and patience. You know, one of the ways I think the patience of a DFI, at least in our case, has manifested itself is in a very interesting uh, um, com comparison of two numbers. Our NPLs, our non-performing loans, are actually pretty high, sort of six, seven percent, but the write-offs are consistently less than one percent, like less than a half of one percent. So the gap between those two means a lot of work and a lot of patience to make sure that deals that struggle or trip or fall, you know, get back up on their feet and end up working out. That's the kind of work that a, a bank wouldn't do. So I think there's some interesting ways of measuring that additionality. The second thing I want to mention on this question of are we catalytic to, to uh, private sector investment or are we crowding it out? And the word additionality, of course, means are we actually doing work that is additional to what would happen without our existence? And I think on that it's very interesting. The OPEC zone experience is kind of interesting. You know, we, political risk insurance used to be the 80, 90% 80, of what we did. Um, and what we found in the last 20 years is it's shrunk a lot and we're left only with the riskiest places on the earth because the private market, OPIC having invented the product, the private market is now doing it. So we're squeezed back appropriately to the places that no private insurer would ever go, which I think is exactly how it should be. And now PRI is only, say, 10% of what we do, and we're having to invent interesting twists and turns of what political risk insurance means. You know, for example, we've, we're, we're providing insurance to, uh, to cover the changes in feed-in tariffs for renewable energy developers. Uh, for example, or other things that I won't go into. Uh, in India, uh, the Indian banks weren't touching the solar industry, the solar power industry, because they didn't believe in the sustainability of the subsidies. So we went in there with very long-term financing, even though it wasn't a perfect regulatory environment. And now the Indian banks are coming along, and so we're no longer doing it uh, in, in solar in India. So I think you can do that. A lot of people often talk about measuring the leverage that you're getting from the private sector as, a, as an indicator of how effective you are at catalyzing private uh, sector capital. And I would just highlight on that, it's a very dangerous uh, number to use because what we find is the easier the deal, the bigger number you can get in terms of leverage. So, you know, deals in you know, geothermal in, in Mexico, yeah, I can do $1 of OPIC money for seven of the private market. 
But I'm telling you that hotel in Juba, I'm not getting I'm not getting five dollars of private money for everyone. We're getting much lower leverage. So I've heard it's lovely in October in Juba. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so those are the two things I would just uh, nuance a little bit about the whole question of the DFI's role and whether it's concessional or not, and and the question of what's our added value. Okay. Okay, Harold. I'm going to give the microphone to Harold Rosen. Harold was at IFC for 25 years, um, and he spun off something called the Grassroots Business Fund, which blends investment capital and technical assistance. And so I know you have views about the roles of DFIs, and so if you might just comment a little bit about what you've heard, but also if you would just spend a minute commenting on if you were starting a Greenfields DFI in a country like Canada or Australia, what would you do? I see Elizabeth snickering up there. I'll try to. I'm snickering be nervously when you take the microphone, is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> May not be the only one in the room, but no, first of all, thank you. Actually, two of my largest funders in my current setup are there on the stage. You know, some of us say if a meteor were to hit the stage, I would be out of business. So, <laughs> really, on the, we have a dual structure which has a nonprofit that builds capacity and social impact in the businesses into which the for profit fund invests. Canada is our biggest funder in the nonprofit. Elizabeth's organization is the biggest funder or investor in our fund. So uh, while of course there's creaking and groaning in this blending world, uh, these are about the class acts of the development field and I've been around it long enough that uh, I don't drop such compliments easily. We are still a pretty scary organization breaking lots of traditional molds and these two organizations, the Canadian government and OPIC, really have stepped out front and uh, held their breath and joined up with GBF, so that deserves a lot of credit. Uh, I always, always say everyone's uh, dollars or euros are the same color, but the, uh, let's say the ethos of the people and the organizations behind them are different, so that's a long-winded thank you to both of you. Um, when we say creaking and groaning, I've been a student and observer of this for a long time, that they're trying to blend different sorts of capital. We all focus on just the funding side, so of course putting debt mezzanine and first loss equity into a capital stack like we have is already creaking and groaning. And then you combine that with uh, grant-funded capacity building, which is where Canada is helping us. Uh, that's a lot of uh, things to get right. And the combination of that takes a lot of patience. Outside of the microfinance world, which Elizabeth and I know well, there's, I would say, precious few examples of well-functioning sidecar facilities. So, uh, you know, Desjardins, OPIC, uh, sorry, uh, Action, ProCredit, there's dozens of them in microfinance, but to put capacity building and capital stack blending into agriculture for the poor in Africa, for instance, I don't want to say unheard of, but uh, there aren't too many others doing that. And really, the uh, <clears throat> Canadians being willing to experiment with first loss in the capital stack, for instance, uh, or use their let their capacity building money be used flexibly that, in my view, is far more important than how much money and just what kind. It's a model. We have 30 angel investors who are thrilled to death. I haven't even told them which one, but when I mentioned a G7 country is in the process of setting up some new money, and as Elizabeth said, learning from all the lessons of experience, uh, these are some pretty accomplished business people are thrilled at the idea that, well, they're already in partnership with it, and you know, maybe through things like us, or there was another transaction with Elizabeth where the Canadians were involved. That's a thrill for the private sector to say someone who can cut through the morass and hasn't been at it for 50 years in this area. That's exciting. Uh, the private sector, I'd emphasize also, there's, uh, uh, there's room for them to invest in capital funds like, like ours. ours. There's also a ton of opportunities to co-invest. Uh, I think the ways in which we combine with the private sector, they can also be investors in the DFIs, and some of us have been around long enough that we remember cases like CDC in the UK, which privatized. Uh, that's one model, is to bring in private capital. Those of us who like agriculture, and I guess we can say it within this room, um, I go back long enough that I remember when if you wanted to do an agricultural estate in PNG and have someone who could both manage it, invest into it, and put a little capacity building in, that was CDC. Those, that's been long gone, and a lot of us feel that that was a case of bringing private capital into a DFI, let's say, and not really thinking through what did they want the thing to do. Uh, some would say a little bit like that on the funds business. There's been some privatizing on that side. My point to the Canadians, and Dan asked me a pretty open question, is what would I do if I were starting from scratch? Uh, just to challenge my friend Elizabeth a little bit, how separate and how independent and commercial would somebody want that DFI to be? 
I think we have lots of cases in the world where it sounds good, but uh, let's say the organization can often take on a head of its own, and I have seen a number of cases of that screeching and groaning actually happening when the shareholder governments, uh, let's say, try to pull the organization back to what it's about. This is perhaps what Malcolm was referring to uh, far more diplomatically than I would. Uh, <clears throat> I would just say my experience, if you were saying how long is the Canadian government going to look at if it sets up a proper DFI, maybe two, three years just to get the organization up and running, probably another two or three years making sure it'll do sort of what you want it to do and then maybe making adjustments. Uh, I always go back to look at the different challenge funds. It takes two months, you hire a consulting firm, you say this is exactly what we want it to do. You'd be a world leader in whatever field you want it to be and you can learn enough, meet people, set up your DFM, DFI whenever you want. But to start, I've seen so many cases where people set up DFIs and they say, couldn't we have just done challenge funds? Or I mean, I got my money from Canada and then I'll wrap this up. I have two and a half million dollars. We got that from the G20 SME challenge. And this is not a criticism, but I wouldn't have even known which door to walk in at any large donor agency to get that, except we got lucky there was a contest. And even with all my connections, uh, it's a little bit of a lesson. If you set up a DFM, you're going to be putting large wholesale blocks of money into an intermediate organization and trying through government governance to, let's say, affect it in the direction you'd like. So that's a little bit too absolutist, but I would just throw that out as a bit of being a provocateur. And thank you all very much, though. Both of you have done a great job. You can send the check for the advertising to 1616 Rhode Island Avenue. But no, thank, thank you, no, Harold, thank you. I think I, I really am a big believer in what Harold is doing at the Grassroots Business Fund. So I think it, thank you for that, that, uh, that, uh, that question and those comments. Do you want to just respond a little bit to that? Do I want to give you a chance to respond, both of you, to just what, what Harold had to say? Because I think he was being provocative. Um, so. Yeah, no, I think those are those are excellent points. I mean, I, I think the when I speak about the independence, I'm I'm trying to be independent from uh, from government priorities and foreign policy, being telling it what to do and directed lending and that kind of thing. Uh, but I think you can also be independent with people that are committed to the development mission, pretty pretty readily too, right? Um, Harold, you've. Um it's the second time in two weeks I've seen you because I, I was at the W, uh, the WEF uh, function you did with uh, Minister Parity and it, uh, in, on the margins of UNGA. So I've heard more from you on, on this issue, uh, on DFIs generally. And, and um, so I, I do think this question, it's not, um, it, it's, I think the question is how you do it. Um, there's, there are always a series of trade offs. Um, I think, you know, if I were, this isn't Chatham House rule, but if I were, you know, if I, well, I better stop. If I were advising the government, I am advising the government. Um, the, but I think the, the questions are, you can, you can design an organization that's independent and check that box and design it really badly and, and it will go rogue on you. Uh, some of that is who you, uh, who, who you have lead it. Uh, choices about people matter. You can also um, uh, do the model you described in terms of using challenge funds and that sort of thing to get some things done right away. I think personally, and this is a personal view, if you're going to do the DFI, you're doing it for a generation. You're not doing it for the next, you know, four or five years. Because to actually, I think your timeline that you described, I think is pretty accurate. You know, it's going to take time to get it right and you're not going to pour a truckload of money in uh, at the front end. That gives you some flexibility in terms of the kinds of things you'll do because the, you, you, the, the, the nature of the market you'll be participating in in terms of your capitalization path uh, is going to dictate the kinds of, uh, you know, you're probably not going to start with a billion dollars. Um, so, but I do think uh, a lot of care and a lot of thought has to go in at the very beginning. You've got to make some choices. Uh, and how you structure uh, the deal, like any deal, uh, how you structure it up front is absolutely essential. Uh, and you've got to sort of poke and prod. And, and to be frank, there is, um, I think, a balance. Uh, while I'm a public servant, I actually do sort of subscribe to the guys in the corner office. The political level does actually get to provide direction. That's the way our system operates. Uh, it's, uh, we have been very lucky, I would say, in the development sphere. 
uh, there had been some noise, which is frankly, you know, a distraction. Uh, but the actual fundamentals of development in Canada uh, have been remarkably free uh, of the kind of unconstructive politics and, and full of actually uh, um, um, very thoughtful uh, political leadership. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons why we're having conversations about uh, DFIs is because of political leadership. Um, so I think there's a balance there. It's not, you know, all politics is bad and or it's all good, but it goes to how you structure it from the beginning. And you've got to poke and prod and, and test it. You've got to look at examples of what's worked and not worked and then design the model that works best for your own domestic uh, circumstance, which is one of the things Elizabeth said at the beginning. So I could, maybe I just come in on the money part. <laughs> um, because I do think you have to start big enough to, to matter. Um, when we were created back in 1961, we were, OPIC was established with about $4 billion from the government in capital and, and because Richard Nixon felt that the private sector needed its own investment banking kind of thing to, to support the private sector's role in, in, uh, in development and, and it was quite prescient, as it turns out. Now we were able to generate enough income because of that, that size that we were able to present to Ronald Reagan a huge check paying back all that capital, which we were able to pay back from their revenues we'd earned. And then for the last 36 years straight, we've been earning money every, every year consistently. So I, I think um, on the money front, I think you have to start big enough to matter is all, is all I would say. And then you create a business model with, like, such as the one we have now, which is every, eight, every dollar you put in in terms of operating expenses is kicking off eight that somebody else can spend. So, um, uh, anyway, that was the first thing I'd say. The second thing is that in terms of how profitable the model is, is going to depend not only on some of the risk appetites that, that Harold uh, mentioned earlier, which are incredibly important, but what we've found is it's actually less about the, the risks that we take because we're able to get paid back be, by being the U.S. government, by working hard, by being patient, by visiting the client, whatever. The key is the instruments. Most of my fellow de development finance institution heads in the community that we operate in, because we meet regularly, say they could never in a million years break even without the equity instrument. They're making all their money on their private equity portfolio. And yet we're yeah, struggling sure. because we're having to break even every year with the debt instrument, which is tricky. So I think the tools matter more than the risk appetite when it comes to uh, the financial sustainability of the, of the model. I just I want to take advantage of your presence here just to... I'll play devil's advocate and just push a couple more. I want to come back to this criticism of is OPIC or IFC crowding out mm -hmm. large money center banks? When you hear that, what, what's your response to that? That's the first, the criticism that's sort of out there in the, in the system and has been alluded to in this conversation. The second is, is you'll hear this from some of my colleagues in other think tanks. They'll say, well, OPIC um, is somehow rewarding bad policies by providing capital. And I, my, my, I have a, a different view, but I, I at least want to hear what you have to say about those. If you could just speak to those two, because I'm sure that they're, they're going to come up whether we're, in, whether we're in Canberra or whether we're in Ottawa. These are going to be questions that are going to come up. So on the crowding out question, yeah. um, we, we require every one of our uh, transactions, to the, the, the sponsor to represent that financing was not available in the private markets. Now, it's true, the financing may be available, but it's too short-term to make sense because they're building an infrastructure project and the local markets will only provide two or three-year financing. Or it may be, you know, there may be a, a myriad of other reasons why the financing is not available, but we do require that they represent that. Um, the second piece of that is we're actually with the private markets, we're, we, because of our absurdly small size, uh, we have almost as many countries that we're responsible for covering as we do staff, which is kind of a crazy place to be. Um, we work very closely with those very banks. So, for example, we have a $2 billion relationship with Citigroup, with Wells Fargo, with a number of other organizations wherein they're originating deals through their network, but risks that they can't possibly underwrite themselves. So they're providing the origination, and then we're wrapping it with a, a guarantee. But we require them to have some skin in the game, so they'll take 25% of the risk. And, and we'll take 75. So I think it's partnership, and again, I would harken back to what I said earlier, partnership with, between a number of financial institutions, each of whom brings whatever their unique appetites and abilities are to the table, whether it be equity coming to support a debt deal, whether it be long-term tenors supporting a long-term financing need, whether it be origination capabilities in local offices, 
supporting uh, an organization that has a greater risk appetite but no local presence. So um, anyway, that's that's what I would I would say around that question. You know, the second question I've I've heard this I've heard this from a couple of folks um, on the Hill. The question of whether or not um, by investing in a market that is difficult, where the risks are are high and the policies aren't right, is effectively moral hazard. Um, and I thought it was a, an interesting question, a thought-provoking one, but the experience that, that we've had is that by having, in this case, often an American investor coming into a market, you're automatically introducing, Pakistan. just by, by, right, by, by, um, by modeling higher labor standards, higher env environmental standards, you know, higher job training, and, 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 and as well as an engagement on the policy and regulatory framework that's required to make that business succeed. So we find more often than not um, that uh, we're actually having a positive uh, effect with our sponsors and our, and our partners on the, on the local environment. Let me just push a little bit further. We had a conversation yesterday with the head of strategy for the African Development Bank, and he asked us to convene a number of companies because he's interested in trying to get more American companies to go to Africa. Mm -hmm. I would think Canada is also particularly interested in this, especially in the Francophone part of Africa. Could you talk a little bit about uh, how OPIC works in Africa and, and how sort of these issues play out in terms of both uh, issues such as standards as well as perceptions of risk as well as um, ro in terms of are you crowding out? If you could just kind of just take take this conversation and put it, put, take those lenses and put it on, on, on the African continent for a minute and just reflect right. on that. So, and then we'd love to hear your, your views on this as well, Malcolm. Um, so we made Africa a, ma a major priority for us because we want to be focusing on lower and lower income countries in a, in a part to address exactly what you're talking about, you know, going to markets where there is no banking, uh, there's no financial flows at all. And we're very proud that Africa is now almost, is this year for the first time ever will be a full third of our portfolio. And that's up from single digits only, you know, a decade or so ago. So we've seen a huge growth uh, in, in our business in Africa that re is reflective of the effort we've made on the continent, but is also reflective of demand because we do, we do follow demand. Um, and what we've seen in, in actually in market after market, when we combine our resources with, for example, under Power Africa, the president's uh, initiative for uh, doubling the access of Africans to power, We've seen that a partnership between AID and ourselves has actually been very effective because they have the ability to provide technical assistance to do things like help us work with a country to make a power purchase agreement long enough to be, you know, financeable, and then we come in with financing or providing TA or, le or expenses to cover legal fees. So these have been very effective partnerships uh, under the Power Africa work. Um, Tony, we're, we're very excited to see our portfolio now, you know, in the seven, eight hundred million every, it's the largest every year. part of your portfolio is now in Africa? It's the largest part of our portfolio. Okay, well, that's, that's different than, say, ten years ago. Right? For, yes, it was, it was only eight or, eight or nine percent ten, exactly. ten years ago. So that's it. Malcolm, I'll give you the last word because then we're going to wrap it up. Sure. Um, I mean, the sh short answer to your question is yes. Um, the longer answer, slightly longer answer is um, we're spending a lot of time, the government is spending a lot of time actually thinking about um, uh, improving um, the, the presence of the Canadian private sector mm -hmm. throughout Africa. We have just had uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, a, a Canada-Africa business conference in, in uh, Toronto where uh, very senior leaders from uh, all over Africa and senior business leaders came together <clears throat> to have a series of two or three days worth of conversation about how to um, access those markets. I think we there are a few sectors, mining as an obvious one, extractives is an obvious one, um, where I think we are, uh, are relatively well represented. But um, hydroelectric, you can go down the list, financial services, there are all sorts of sectors where we think we are uh, uh, coming nowhere close to meeting the potential. And part of the reason we've amalgamated the department, uh, we used to be, I used to, would have been the president of CETA 18 months ago. One of the reasons we amalgamated the department was actually to lever a, a, a better link between trade and development. 
uh, and, and it reflects his perspective about the role the private sector can play uh, to the benefit of uh, both uh, host and um, uh, not donor, but uh, um, sending countries in the context of the private sector. So um, there is a whole bunch of ambition and we are nowhere near close to meeting that. Great. Okay. Elizabeth, thanks for being here. I thank really you. appreciate it. Uh, Malcolm Brown, thank you for being here. I thought this was an absolutely fascinating discussion. Uh, we, we definitely went there in terms of talking about some of the hotter button issues that I think are, you know, are complex, complicated as you think about setting up a DFI and the challenges and opportunities for DFIs, but I really appreciate you both being here. And we're going to make a sweat, set change. If people can stay in their chairs, we're going to go now to the final panel. We're going to hear from the minister as well. So. Uh, please join me in thanking Elizabeth Littlefield and Malcolm Brown. <laughs>